portion of this video is sponsored by Motion VFX. Back here in the corner of the Apple Store is the last iPod. It's a 32 gig iPod Touch. And it's quite possibly one of the most confusing products Apple makes today. The iPod is basically dead. But that wasn't always the case with the iPod. The history of the iPod goes far and deep, from a failing company to a trillion dollar success. And even though the iPod is rarely talked about anymore, this may be one of the most important product developments in the history of technology, and it changed the face of the world forever. Before we get to the iPod, it's important to understand what the world was like back then and what Apple was doing as a company. Let me tell you, things were not going well. The 90s almost spelled the end for Apple Computer Inc. And only years later did we learn how close the company was from the brink. But just when it seemed like there was no hope for the company, the savior returned. In 1997, Steve Jobs came back to Apple as interim CEO, and it would change the face of not only the company, but the entire world forever. Uh, this company's absolutely gonna turn around. As a matter of fact, I think the question now is, 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 is not, can we turn around Apple? Uh, I think that's the booby prize. I think it's, can we make Apple really great again? So Steve had learned a lot since he left Apple in 1985. He started the next computer company. He was a big part in founding Pixar, maybe a little company you've heard of, and he did a lot of personal growing that he would later claim allowed him to be a success that he ultimately grew into. Once he was back at Apple, Jobs started just cleaning house. These weren't just minor changes to certain product lines. These were drastic changes that cut entire projects, products, and future developments from the lineup. He said a lot of this doesn't make sense, and it's way too much stuff, and there's not enough focus, and so we actually got rid of 70% of the stuff on the product roadmap. So instead of dozens of models and SKUs, there were now the famous four squares. A consumer desktop and laptop, a professional desktop and laptop, and that's it. That is what Apple and Jobs focused on. So in 1998, shortly after Jobs returned, the first iMac was introduced, and it was a huge hit. Compared to the bland, boring beige boxes from the office, the translucent, colorful plastic of the iMac sold a whopping 800,000 units in its first quarter on sale. Now compared to today's sales numbers, that's tiny, but for Apple at the time, it was better than filing for bankruptcy, and that followed up with the iBook. It was the iMac in laptop form. And it was clear that Apple was on a new path, and it was one that was radically different. But successful computers aside, this is what really started the foundation for what was to come. The iMac was a signal to the future, and everything that came after was a stepping stone to what ultimately become Apple's first major worldwide hit, the iPod. It was incremental, but that was exactly the approach that Jobs wanted. Enough technology, usually from fairly diverse places, comes together and makes something that's a quantum leap forward possible. And usually they're not quite possible, but all of a sudden you start to sense things coming together and the planets lining up to where this is now possible or barely possible. And a window opens up. In the 90s, the technology for what we all dreamed of and what we have today wasn't ready. It didn't exist. But as long as Apple didn't stay still, and as long as Apple innovated and stayed ahead of the pack, they could implement new technologies as soon as possible to create new experiences and products. But that thinking wasn't just with products, it was with pretty much everything Apple did. Our customers wanna know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for. Apple at the core, its core value, is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. The Think Different campaign perfectly illustrated who Apple at least believed that they were and what it wanted their consumers to think about themselves. This isn't just a computer company. This is a company that will let you express yourself and be the hub of your digital world. That was the message. In fact, Think Different was not only grammatically incorrect, it was the direct opposite 
of IBM's Think slogan. Apple finally had a true identity and it was vastly different than everything else out there. So this mindset combined with implementing the latest tech led to rapid innovation in everything Apple did. We are living in a new digital lifestyle with an explosion of digital devices. It's huge. And we believe the PC or more importantly, the Mac can become the digital hub of our new emerging digital lifestyle. Digital hub, key phrase. So the software on these computers was way more important than the hardware. And during this time of development, Apple started introducing more lifestyle apps. The iLife suite, which introduced apps like iMovie and iPhoto, started to get developed. One of the biggest steps was the adoption of digital music on your computer and the later introduction of iTunes in 2001. Apple was building its first ecosystem. And for the first time, you could start to kind of live in this Apple world. Let's say the walls to the garden were just starting to go up. And now that the software and hardware were in place, Apple could start looking towards everything else and developing what connected to that hub. There it is, right there. 1,000 songs in your pocket. So Apple introduced the first iPod on October 23rd, 2001. And the story of getting to this point is a tale of right time, right place. Everything came together to make the iPod possible and really unique in the market. So at the time, digital music players already existed, but they did not look like the iPod. Most of the time they were integrated into CD players. These were expensive and huge, plus they couldn't store many songs. So flash players also existed and they were small, but again, they didn't store many songs and they were also generally really expensive. But the iPod was different. John Rubenstein worked with Steve Jobs at Next Computers. And when Jobs returned to Apple, he asked Rubenstein to join Apple with him. So he helped develop the iMac and then the iPod. But initially, Rubenstein was skeptical. Jobs wanted Apple to make a digital music player, but Rubenstein didn't think the technology was ready yet. But this is where fate steps in. On a trip to Macworld Japan in February 2001, Rubenstein had a routine meeting with Toshiba, as one would do when they're a major head of a tech company. And this is where Toshiba showed off their brand new 1.8 inch hard drive. And as soon as Rubenstein saw this, the light bulb went off. This is exactly what was needed to make the iPod a reality. This is what would bring that 1000 songs to your pocket. And so development got underway pretty quickly. So you might be a bit confused by the dates that I just gave. The iPod was announced in October 2001, but Rubenstein saw the hard drive in February. Surely the iPod couldn't be ready that quickly. The dates are correct. The original iPod was developed in about eight months. Steve Jobs, ever the marketer, wanted this product ready for the Christmas holiday shopping season. So months rather than years was the time they had. So this meant Rubenstein had to get creative. He eventually brought on board Tony Fidel, and he is often credited with being the creator of the iPod, and he really is. In 1999, Fidel started a company called Fuse that was focused on creating a small hard disk music player. This project ultimately failed, but it did catch the attention of Apple. And in 2001, he was hired by Apple to design the iPod strategy. So he created the basic design for the iPod, hired his previous employees from Fuse, and created the iPod and Special Projects Group at Apple. With the people in place, the iPod development was in crunch time, and by October, it was finally revealed. And it was an extremely simple project, but brilliantly executed. It fits in your pocket. There's no on or off button. It's made of stainless steel. Your fingers are the control mechanism scrolling through your music. There's a firewire port and a hold button. That's it. That's what the iPod was. Looking back, there's no confusion as to why the iPod became such a success. But at the time, the iPod was not without its quirks. First, it was Mac only. And sure, like in today's day and age, Mac only means you have millions and millions of devices to work with. Uh, but back then, the Mac market share was minuscule compared to Windows. So that on its own was a huge disadvantage right out of the gate. It was also really expensive. It started at $400. And in 2022, it's equivalent to almost 650 bucks. And that's for what was really just a proof of concept. Apple hadn't made an accessory like this, at least not a successful one, 
So that was a lot of money to part with. But by the end of the year, Apple had sold 125,000 iPods, which was pretty impressive. Quirk to the original iPod aside, Apple had a winning product on its hands. It was easy to use, simple, and it always worked. Something Apple still sticks to to this day. So things with the iPod are about to get like pretty juicy, uh, but I do want to take a break uh, and thank this video sponsor, Motion VFX. And quite honestly, this is a video that I probably would have done anyway. Uh, if you've ever watched pretty much any YouTuber and you've wondered how do they learn how to do that, how they make that crazy transition, listen, there's a secret that I'm going to let you in on. We didn't learn how to do it. Uh, we down we download them for Motion VFX. I guarantee you, pretty much every YouTuber you watch uses. Motion VFX. So if you've like watched any of our videos and you wonder like how we get those really cool like specs for phones or any product we're doing, uh, it's a Motion VFX plugin. It's called appropriately uh, M Callout Specs, or how we and other YouTubers get that really cool like subscribe button and that kind of stuff, all done, animated and looking beautiful. It's M Tuber Three, and they've got a bunch of other options in there you can customize to get a really awesome looking video uh, without having to learn sort of crazy VFX things. You really just drag and drop and fill in the blank and you are done. Uh, whatever you are editing, they've got something for you. Give it a shot, peruse it. I guarantee you if you are making content, there's something there uh, that will work for you. If you wanna check out Motion VFX, and again, you definitely should, I will link to them down below. So year after year, Apple improved the design of the iPod and started to fix those quirks. From 2001 to 2003, Apple took some of the biggest steps to make the iPod as mainstream as possible. In 2003, the iTunes Music Store was introduced. 99 cents per song, $10 per album, all in iTunes and instantly downloaded to your iPod. No longer was iTunes a place to just organize your music. It was now your one-stop shop for your entire music world. Buy from Apple, organize with Apple, and listen with Apple. The iPod ecosystem was forming. And later in 2003, Apple took another huge step, releasing iTunes for Windows, fixing another annoying quirk of the iPod. And now millions of people with a PC could take the first step into Apple's garden. But what really sealed the deal was this. It's called the iPod Mini. The iPod Mini was the first iteration of the original iPod and it filled a market that would allow the iPod to just skyrocket in sales. It was the first iPod with different color options. It introduced the click wheel with buttons built in, and it was tiny compared to the original. But best of all, it started at $250, way cheaper than the original iPod. This new iPod mini, along with the iTunes Music Store and Windows compatibility, culminated with the iPod going mainstream. In June 2003, three years after release of the iPod, Apple had sold a total of 1 million units. But by the end of 2004, just one year later, iPod sales soared to 10 million. The iPod was now the product that you had to have. The iPod ecosystem was here. So now if you wanted an iPod, you could actually get one without too much compromise, if any at all. And Apple didn't stop there. They were on top of their game and innovation was continuing. In 2005, Apple released the next version of the iPod, the iPod Shuffle, and this was a radical departure from what the iPod was originally, but it was developed directly from info from iPod users. Turns out one of the most used iPod features was the song shuffle feature, and Apple decided to make an entire product around it. So it was basically a USB stick with no screen and a few buttons. You just loaded music onto it and let shuffle feature do the work for you. And shortly after that, in September 2005, Apple debuted the replacement to the iPod mini. Because this is the new iPod mini. Starting at $200, the iPod Nano radically changed the face of iPod. Tiny form factor, color display, a beautiful stainless steel enclosure. This was truly a nano iPod. And in October, Apple released the iPod video which let you watch TV shows and movies alongside your music. This time period was huge for the iPod. New technologies like flash storage became affordable enough to create new products, and the software behind it was now really solid. The mindset of using new technology as soon as it was ready was clearly still a priority for Apple, and it meant the iPod continued to be the device 
that everybody wanted. By this point, Apple had sold 14 million iPods and was selling 100 iPods every minute, 24 hours a day. That's a, that's a lot of iPods. But Apple's biggest update was coming and it would change the iPod forever. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. The iPhone introduction this is one for the history books. But aside from introducing the world's most revolutionary tech product, it also put the iPod on the back burner. The iPod was no longer the favorite child. It was the cash cow, but it wasn't the star. Unsurprisingly, iPhone had a huge impact on the iPod. Apple continued to update the iPod year after year, and they were still really popular. But after a bit of time, it was clear the iPhone was stealing the show, and that led to Apple introducing the iPod Touch. And looking at it, you basically think it's an iPhone without the phone, which it basically is. But it's more iPod than it initially looks. There was no phone, obviously. There's also no camera. There was a stainless steel back, just like the original iPod. And the original didn't even have a speaker like iPods, and it didn't have any apps because the app store had yet to be released. The iPod Touch kept the iPod fundamentals, and brought the amazing touch interface from the iPhone. But even with these limitations, the Touch was a roaring success. And even though the iPhone and iPod Touch stole the spotlight, Apple was still working on new iPods. And I even argue that because of the iPhone, the iPod was able to experiment a little bit more. The iPod Nano 5 had a camera built in for taking photos and videos, which to this day still seems crazy and fake. Like it doesn't, doesn't seem like a real product, um, but it was. And the next iPod Nano, the 6th gen, was also given a touchscreen for the first time, and it was a precursor to the Apple Watch. It was square with a clip built in, had a clock app built in with different faces. Apple clearly expected people would wear this as a watch, and third parties made bands let you do exactly that. It was a weird but fun time for the iPod. But even with this innovation, the iPhone was growing more and more popular, and the iPod was becoming just less so. Apple settled on a few models that just kept around for years. The original iPod became the iPod Classic in 2007 and really didn't change aside from storage size for pretty much seven years before it eventually was discontinued in 2014. The seventh gen iPod Nano was released in 2012, became this mashup of iPod and iPhone with a touchscreen and a home button, but a strange iOS looking iPod software. And that didn't change until it was discontinued in 2017 along with the iPod Shuffle. Slowly but surely, the iPod began to die. The glory days of the iPod didn't last all that long. 2001, 2007 would be emblazoned on its tombstone, and those years passed in the blink of an eye. And once the iPhone was announced, the iPod very much took a backseat. Even though you probably haven't thought about it for months, if not years, uh, the iPod still exists, but its days are clearly numbered. Only model left is the iPod Touch, which hasn't been updated in years, and it costs $199. If you want an iPod in 2022, this is your only option. And if you compare this iPod Touch to the original iPod, you could say that Apple killed the iPod a long time ago, and what we have now is nothing more than a stripped down iPhone. But that's not really true. The iPod just changed. Three things a widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. Steve Jobs said it right on stage. The iPhone is an iPod, but it's the ultimate incarnation. It has more features, more capability, and more power than I think anyone could have ever imagined. And it changed the world in ways that we still have yet to realize. The iPod was the start of the personal technology revolution. When Steve Jobs introduced it in 2001, he would probably say that he knew the iPod would change the world. But I don't think even he could have expected what that truly meant. <laughs>